no microphone. To, I got no strings to hold me down, but I got a microphone to hold me down. And I thought about teaching like the old school. Turn in your Bibles to Second Thessalonians chapter number one. We will be reading from Paul's epistle. I might fall asleep. Lesson number nine, if you got a lesson book. Second Thessalonians chapter one is where we're going to be. And boy, it, it, like always, lots of things to talk about. Uh, but we'll try to stay focused. Uh, again, encourage you to pray for our leadership again this week. My understanding, a significant case going in front of the Supreme Court that is of interest to believers when it comes to abortion issues. Um, they, they tell you you're not supposed to talk about political things or take political positions, but if you've if you got no idea what my political position is on abortion, you probably don't know me at all. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, but again, pray for our leaders. The Bible tells us to do so, that we might live quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness and honesty. And that's the way we ought to pray. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, um, Paul wrote this letter from, again, you get a mixed bag of, of when most believed a handful of months after he wrote 1 Thessalonians. And 1 Thessalonians ends with the, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And so apparently some folks in the church thought, well, if that's the case, I'll just sit back and watch football all day and, and have a good time. And Paul said, well, no. As, as we now know, the return of Christ wasn't going to happen within about the first 2,000 years after he wrote that. It's been about 2,000 years since he wrote 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and Jesus hasn't come back yet. But we should still look for him today. Uh, kick off verse, verse number 7. And to you are troubled, rest with us. And we'll read the rest of that verse in, in a little bit. But the challenge is staying focused. I don't know about you. Does anybody have trouble staying focused on what's important in life? Then whatever you feel like yesterday, how many folks paid attention to a football game or two or three or 28 that really doesn't matter in eternity? Did anybody watch a Mountaineer game? Does, does it matter? Anybody watch Michigan or High State? Is anybody Michigan or High State? Is anybody a High State fan? I feel sorry for you. Anybody at Virginia Tech? I guess Virginia Tech won against Virginia, and Alabama beats a one-legged quarterback on another team, and folks get Oklahoma State beats Oklahoma, and everybody gets excited, and USC and UCLA play. And again, I'm a sports fan. The Braves won a World Series, but in eternity, I don't – I hate to say – it pains me to say it. I don't know if it matters. It did. It mattered in October. It was fun. November was fun. And it's a challenge to say, folks, we have so many things in life, whether it's weather or conditions or how many folks, anybody go out Black Friday shopping, whether online or in the, it is easy to get distracted. The challenge of Christianity is we need to stay focused because there's people dying without Christ that need a Savior. There are Christians that are struggling asking the question, hey, is it worth it? Um, the latest fear, uh, apparently, I'm, I'm going to learn the, how many folks know the Greek alphabet? I'm learning it because of COVID. I appreciate COVID. It helps me learn the Greek alphabet. My understanding, we skipped over XI is the next letter. Omicron is the next one, right? That's the one that's coming. Um, sky's falling. We skipped over it because XI also happens to be the name of, the, of the, the, the leader in China. I find that kind of weird. But not that it's his name, but why do we skip over a letter? We can fear all kind of, we can focus on all kind of stuff. We need to stay focused on the purpose that God has created us for. I get excited. We're going to talk about that in the lesson, and I'll get to it in a second. Is it God created us for divine purpose? I can't get past that. God created Dave Newsom for a divine purpose. God created Tracy Davis for a divine purpose. God created Kurt Snyder for a divine purpose. God created J.R. Dotson for a divine purpose. And everybody, if you want to know why Paul people names, they give me $10 when I mention people's names on the Internet. So if you'd like me to mention your name this Christmas season, $10, and that'll be fine. And for those who are on, that's, I'm joking, I'm kidding. So when I run for president someday, oh, Helms of God that charged people to say, no, I'm just kidding. But God created each of us for a divine purpose, which I'm not kidding about unbelievable that the creator of the universe created you and I for divine purpose to make a difference in 2021, the United States of America, West Virginia, North Central West Virginia, is incredible. That's what we need to stay focused on. So that's the essence of the lesson. Stay focused on that which we are created for, to make a difference for eternity. Well, I have a word of prayer, now we'll get in the lesson. Our Lord and our God, we love you, we need you, we are humbled uh, that you allow us uh, to be partakers of the divine nature, to be partakers of divine promises. Lord, this Thanksgiving season, we are certainly mindful of your goodness to us. Lord, if all we had were salvation, if we lived in a country that uh, discouraged and hindered and even jailed people for preaching truth, we would still be blessed folks. Lord, if we, if we were living in a shack, we would still be blessed folks if we had salvation. But Lord, you've blessed us in so many ways, uh, both in temporal things as well as eternal. Lord, we pray for your power. Uh, we need you. Uh, Lord, it's not going to be about the stock market or the monetary system. It's not going to be about what the possessions we have or the health we have uh, or even the, the beauty of the church you've given us. 
but it's going to be about you to, to make a difference in a world that needs your son. We pray for grace today. If there's one here that needs Christ, that today be the day of salvation. Uh, we pray for uh, one, whether in the room today or online, uh, that needs encouraged, that needs challenged, that needs blessed. We pray you would fitly frame the message, Lord, for, uh, to encourage those, uh, one that needs encouraged, to, to rebuke one that needs rebuked. Lord, we love you and we need you. We pray to work in our lives. Lord, help us to honor you. We pray for our leaders, uh, that you'd help them to make godly decisions, that we might live quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness and honesty. Lord, we love you. We need you. Bless and direct. Lead us today, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're just going to hit it verse by verse. We want to flip to the next item. Paul starts out with some praise to the church. First four verses that starts pretty much how Paul started every all of his, his books. Paul and Savanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet because that your faith, what a great statement, groweth exceedingly. And we'll talk about that. How do you know that faith is growing? And the charity of every one of you toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all persecutions and tribulations that you endure. And it all starts with foundations. The, the first point on, this, on the screen, the foundation is critical. That's true in so many things in life. I mean, whether you're a sports fan, uh, you'll find a football team that talks about, boy, if, you're, if your line is no good, offensive line is no good, it really doesn't matter how your running backs are, your quarterback, you're going to be in trouble. Um, anybody that lives in a house, anybody ever been in a house where the foundation had a problem? Normally not a good thing. I mean, that's the reason earthquakes become problematic. Well, God's foundation in his church there is pretty solid, founded in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 16 talks about that. The, the place of the foundation of the church. Peter's statement in six, Matthew 16, 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, that Jesus said in verse 18, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build the church. Some have misinterpreted, or I build my church, Jesus said. Some misinterpret that to say that God built his church upon Peter. No, God built his church upon the Savior, upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter in the Greek means rock, pebble, vice, the, the stone that is the foundational stone. And in 1 Timothy 3, 15, the church is the pillar and ground of truth. Again, we live in a world where truth is hard to come by. I mean, if we, if we were to deal with, with all of the fun, it's, it's interesting to go back. I've, I try to pay attention to the news. And the truth about COVID has just been unbelievable. And even this latest variation, is it bad? Is it worse? Well, we're not sure. We need to see this. We need to see that. And it just it becomes challenging. What is, Pilate asked the right question, what is truth? I'm glad we have the scripture that lets us know what truth is. Next item. So the foundation being critical, and there's two authorities in verse number one, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all about relationships. God is a big relationship fan. In fact, the privilege of salvation isn't about where we get to go. It, again, going to heaven is kind of cool. That's, that's a wonderful thing. But you know what? If we were going to be with God and Jesus, I'd be okay living in Clarksburg with the Creator. I mean, God's going to put his, his city upon the earth. But it's about a relationship with Him. And, and this twofold relationship, the one of a father is that family relationship, but it's about authority. God lays out in the scripture over and over and over and over the importance of authority. Uh, that if you've been around this church, pastor, you know, preaches out real well. We are big fans of authority. Um, I'm glad that this authority, unlike our, unlike some governmental authorities that can be problematic, the authority of God the Father and Jesus Christ His Son has no problems whatsoever. And then the word Lord, which is again kind of not common in our in our world. We don't live in a Lord Surf type relationship where the Lord of the Manor. Whatever the Lord said back in the day, that's what you did. That's just the way it was. And the word Lord, I looked that up in the Scripture. Anybody got any idea how many times the Lord shows up in Scripture? That is correct. A lot was the right answer. Yet 6,700 times the variation of Lord, Lordly, Lords. Fairly important principle. And I believe Philippians chapter 2 puts it well at the way Lordship works. Philippians chapter 2, I love that chapter. Verse number 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. So Donald Trump shall bow, Barack Obama shall bow, Bill Clinton shall bow, LeBron James shall bow, Adolf Hitler shall bow, Mo Moses shall bow, the Apostle Paul shall bow, Hank Aaron shall bow, Jason Wilhelm shall bow. You, everybody, everybody is going to bow at the, name, at, the, at the name of Jesus Christ. The things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lordship is, hey, you, you are in charge. You are the ultimate authority. And that's really the way it is today. But do, do I live that way? Do we live that way? Again, certainly God does not exercise all of the power he could choose to exercise, right? If, if God chose to say, I'm not going to put up with any more nonsense, I, 
I think the earth would be a pretty quiet place. The news media, well, the news media would probably be gone, much less have any, nothing to say. We need to recognize the lordship of God, the lordship of Jesus Christ. He ought to be, it ought to be the attitude that's, the, the, again, those yellow bracelets I used to see, WWJD, what would Jesus do? It's even more now, what would Jesus want us to do? Next item. So we got authority. Paul's excited about that. And the word brethren is important in verse number three. Paul's talking to believers. And again, this lesson isn't pointed for the unsaved, but it is critical that, that none of this really matters unless you're a saved person. You know, I really don't care much about IBM stock because I'm not a stockholder. I really don't much care about Exxon stock because I'm not a stockholder. It doesn't apply to me. And the principles and the promises of God don't apply unless you're a believer, at least the ones of, of going to heaven in a relationship with Him. And the simplicity of being a brethren, summarized in Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I love the statement that Jesus made in Luke chapter 10. Do you ever read the Bible and, and picture what people's faces look like? Of people? Anybody do that beside me, or am I just like nuts? Like a couple people, just humor me. So in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent forth 70, two by two it says, in verse number one. And he gave them all kind of power and gave them all kind of instructions. And they come back in verse number 17, and I'm looking at their faces. The 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Man, we got fire. Get out. I'm guessing these guys were fired up. And Jesus says to him, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And he summarizes, verse number 19, he says, Yeah, I gave you power over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But I think he bursts their bubble that, guys, it's not about power over devils. Verse number 20, notwithstanding in this rejoice not. Don't be excited you got power over devils, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice. Why? Because your names are written down in heaven. And again, I've, 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 not ex I've not ever tried to cast demons out of people or devils out of people. But I've been excited to see God do this and God bless this way and God bless that way. I was just thinking about this coming to church today. Was Even before I was a saved person, growing up on a farm here in West Virginia, we didn't have the most of stuff. And apparently one day a, a tractor trailer pulled down our road, which you might say, what's the big deal about that? If you knew the road I grew up, grew up on over the bridge, I'm not sure why the tractor trailer even came across the bridge. The, this, the story was the tractor trailer was going to dump a bunch of soap products. He had a bunch of samples of palm olive and Axion detergent, and he was going to go dump it. We were the first house on the right. Apparently, the truck stopped in front of the house. This is mom's story to me, and said, hey, I got a bunch of soap stuff. Could you all use that? And I can remember as a little kid, we used these little bottles of palm olive for years, for years. I remember Axion being stacked in our other outhouse for years. Not the outhouse, like a toilet, another outbuilding. For years. God provides, again, why the tractor trailer coming across our road? So God could provide some soap to a guy that ultimately, again, for, for folks that are going to get saved later on. Just exciting that God works those things out. And we get excited about that. If you've had God do something in your life that's unusual, you should be excited about it. But we ought to be most excited that our names are written down, that you've got a relationship. And it's not about just church. There's lots of verses that I think are sad. I mean, Revelation, certainly the, the great white throne judgment is a, is a horrible place. But, but I believe the saddest verses I know of are Matthew 7, 21 through 23. That I say very, very carefully to folks that go to churches like ours. Just because you come to this church doesn't make you saved. I appreciate what Pastor Darrington used to say. Just because you, you sit in a garage doesn't make you a car. Just because you go to this church doesn't make you a Christian. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, sad verses that apply to religious folks. Not everyone that saith to me, this is the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And the saddest word I know of verse 22 is the first one. Many, many shall say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name have done many, one, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And Jesus isn't going to say no to any of those things. Yeah, you did those things. Yeah, you did a lot of stuff. But verse 23, but then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Know that you know that you know that you know. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 5 puts it pretty bluntly when it, comes to, when it comes to salvation. Not to be curt, but very straightforward. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, again, he's not being a smart aleck, not being a wise guy. 
Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. He ends his second letter to the Corinthian church with, make sure you know. Examine yourself whether you be in yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove you your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ be in you or is in you, except you be reprobates. And that'd be my message to all of us here, including myself. Hey, know that you know that you know. Because if you don't get it right, just because you've been a member of the church, come to Sunday school, given money, gone on mission trips, played piano, sung in the choir, sung songs, knew how the computer works, read the Bible through 28,000 times, know that you know that you know that you're headed to heaven. Have a relationship with the Creator. Next item. And Paul's thankful for lots of things, and certainly this time of year we talk about Thanksgiving. In, in Philippians chapter 1, verse number 3, it's a verse that I actually use a lot of times when I write cards to folks. Verses 3 and 4, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Verse number 4 is going to show up later, so I won't quote it yet right now. We ought to be thankful, folks. And you ought to be asking a question, is there anybody thankful for us or you and I individually? And it's not a pride thing, it's not an ego thing, but are we doing anything that makes any difference anywhere? Next item. So Paul was thankful for growing faith. And I thought that was an interesting term. I, I got a question. Does anybody know when your, waist, when your waist measurement grows? I got a belt that tells me that. It's got notches on it. So when the notches get, when there's less notches needed, that's a bad thing, right? More notches needed means I'm losing weight. So if that's what I'm trying to do, that's a good thing. Do, do, can you tell when I, anybody ever been around a little child and f the feet that grow like, what, an inch every day or something? I love these people that advertise, our shoes don't wear out for little kids. Well, no kid, they don't wear them long enough. <laughs> Baby shoes don't wear out. Yeah, they got to walk. So we can always tell lots of things that grow. I can, tell, I can tell my fingernails grow. I'm taking, was it vitamin D? Is that what I'm taking? One of the vitamin D fingernails grow faster. You can tell those. How do you tell when your faith's growing? Has anybody got a little faith meter? Boop, 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 getting on full. I mean, how do you know? Paul was thankful for it. I, I think faith growing, it means we exercise, we do things that are predicated, the, the faith growing is evident by works, and those works reflect the fact that we believe what this book has to say. You can measure faith growth by saying, how do I apply what the scriptures say? I mean, this whole debate of faith and works, works are evidence of faith. How do I know that my orange tree is producing oranges? I well, they get lots of oranges off of it. And, this, and that's, again, God wants us to be faith growers. And this faith growth, Philippians, or, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 15, talks about how that growth should be measured. What's the measuring stick? Verse 15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. The more we resemble Jesus Christ, the more our faith grows, or the more evidence of our faith growing. 1 Peter 2, 2 talks about the importance of the word as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. This book is fundamental food for our spiritual growth, for faith growing. Next time. So he's thankful for growing faith. He's also thankful for abounding charity. John chapter 13, Jesus said that you shall know that these are my disciples because they're loved one for another. And again, this church is pretty good about those kinds of things, especially when it comes to, to tragedy. If someone were to have a fire, that, that's happened on occasion in this church where people, are, people have gotten gifts and goods and together. Uh, Christmas time, I've never seen a situation where the Christmas store had nothing to offer. Christmas store that's kind of the glorified yard sale with some, some higher, higher stuff. Got some better stuff. We are pretty good about that. But where does that stop? The abounding charity means it just doesn't stop. It keeps overflowing. It keeps overflowing. We ought to be asking God, God, what can I do to be a blessing to somebody? The Bible tells us not on the, on the screen there and over in the book of Galatians, as you have therefore opportunity, do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. What are we doing to be a blessing to folks? Next item. And the last thing he was thankful for, that this one's not quite as much fun, the testimony of patience and faith. Now, I kind of like that faith part. That patience part, I don't know about you. Is anybody excited about patience? Unless you're a doctor, I'm not sure why patience would be much fun anyway. But that's a poor joke, I know. So, different spelling, gotcha. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 12. There's some verses that I highlight in like yellow, and I'm lying there. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't underline or anything in my Bible. I, if I want to memorize something, I memorize it. There, I've heard folks joke about a verse I don't like, I'll highlight it in black. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 12, that says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That, that's not a part of Christianity I get excited about. Does anybody like being made fun of? Does anybody like being put down? And again, I've, 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 I have been there. Again, I remember being cursed at for trying to help somebody go to heaven when they died. Um, I, am, I am bigoted. I am biased. I've, again, had people 
say that uh, I'm, I'm narrow-minded, I believe, a book that was written 2,000 years ago. What kind of foolish person am I? Anybody ever been challenged for believing the Bible? Is the Bible written 2,000? Yeah, uh-huh, sure is. And you know what? Two plus two was four thousands of years ago. And the principles of truth endure. That's the beauty of truth. Truth is not dependent upon time. James chapter 5, verse number 8. It says, Be ye also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. We ought to be patient, folks. Again, we, we live in a world that's not ours and that doesn't play by the rules that God has set up and sadly seems to be headed down a path that's even farther afield from God. Those things that Paul was thankful for to the church of Thessalonica ought to be things that we ought to be thankful for here. And frankly, things we ought to practice ourselves. Something to think about is, hey, how do I evidence those three things that Paul was thankful for to that church that was, again, had no internet, had no facilities, they didn't have electric lights and electric heat and warm bathrooms and drinking fountains. We have the conveniences, we ought, but we can have this, we have a relationship with the same creator. Next page, yeah, folks. So on that, so God's perspective on tribulation is not necessarily ours. Verse number six makes this statement about the persecutions and tribulations of verse four that he, Paul, as inspired by God, says, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. And if you didn't like that, verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Now, we, now, folks tend to like that part. Yeah, them people ought to get hammered. I'm, I'm not so quick on that one because I don't, I, does anybody want God to, to treat us the way we've treated him? Would anybody like that? You get from God what you, what you deserve from your works? Anybody? How about over the past week? Anybody would be willing to trade that? And hopefully we've done some good things. But again, God's tolerance for sin is zero. God's a, they talk about three strikes and you're out in the, in the criminal world in the United States. Yeah, God does not have three strikes and you're out. God's a one strike and you're out. God's a righteous God. And he says that over and over. In fact, Psalm 7, 9 says that about him. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. Psalm 19, there's a section, again, lots of, I encourage everybody to read all scripture. But verses 7 through 9, I love that passage in, in, in Psalm 19. Six facets of the word of God. Verse number nine, the, the last part of it says, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And Psalm 116, five describes him as the righteous God. God doesn't do anything that's not right. I'm just an, I'm just an honest person. Are there times that something happens, you say, well, how did that happen? Why would God let that happen? Anybody ever done that? Just me, okay. I, humor me then. Yeah, I mean, why, why, does, why does God allow, why did God allow, people ask me, why did God allow September 11th to happen? Why would God have allowed the, the attack at Pearl Harbor to happen? Man, America's a great place. What's going on there? Why does God allow sickness? Anybody ever, anybody have somebody, know somebody that passed away young? I mean, how does God allow little kids? How does God allow little kids? This is what, last week, two weeks ago? Some, some idiot takes a, takes a car, drives it through a parade, just looking to kill people? Could you imagine, how many folks have ever been to a parade? How many folks have ever had a car running at you? I can't imagine that. And I'm not going to be political over that one, but I'd, I'd be glad to share my political thoughts on that. But I can't imagine going to a parade and your child, I mean, was like four children, several children died? Are you kidding? How does God let that happen? Because God allows sinful men to do things. God's going to ultimately step in. I don't, I don't know why God allows what he, and what he doesn't allow. But I could do that in my own life. God, why do you allow me to sin and not just hammer me? Why does God, again, what's, does God want to reach that, that career criminal for the cause of Christ? I don't know. Hopefully that guy gets saved. Apparently from what I've read about him, there's a man that needs to be saved just like I need to be saved. But God is righteous. And so God forbid that we would ever accuse God of doing things poorly. Yet we live in a world where folks want to just thrust. It, it, it amazes me that an ungodly folks that will, will shake a fist at the holy God. Next item. I can camp there because I get, I get dismayed at folks that want to, to hammer God. I, the reason I have a question mark at the end there isn't because I made a mistake. It's because, do I want to be counted worthy? I, man, that, that seems like an odd statement. What does he say there in verse number five? Talking about tribulation. Seeing is a righteous thing with them to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Is, is there anybody who wants to sign up for tribulation? Again, that's not normal, but, but I get humbled when I read The reason I have the, the entire chapter of Isaiah 53 is if you talk to somebody who only believes the Old Testament, 
one of the best pictures of what Jesus Christ came to do and what he did. You know, a lot of folks, again, a lot of Jewish folks will look at the, the Messiah was coming to redeem Israel, to, to deliver Israel, just as, again, the whole situation. Um, some believe that Judas's motivation wasn't just money, but was to force Jesus to become the king and to do the things he was going to go do. Because Judas would have been one of those 70 people doing those things, by the way. But the description of Isaiah 53 is horrible when it comes to humanity. Verse number five, but he was wounded for our iniquities. He was bruised for our, I'm sorry, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, he was healed. I mean, this whole chapter, the 12 verses, talk about just being hammered. Verse number seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. Jesus Christ did all that for nothing that he did. He did that for you and I. So when tribulation comes, that is not because of sin and is not because, again, when I, when I bring things upon myself, hey, that's, that's not suffering for the Savior. When tribulation comes for the Savior's sake, we're, we're in the same camp with the Messiah. We're in the same camp with our Savior. Next item. So we ought not, we ought not be upset about that. The price of tribulation, verse number six, there is a price for crossing tribulation. And, it, and again, I, I, I understand, does anybody ever watch news media that gets fired up about the other side? I don't care if you like MSNBC or Fox News or CNN, and if you like all three of those, I pray for you because you're schizophrenic. Um, I watch all of those to get their perspective, and it is amazing. Two trials, the Kyle Rittenhouse trial and the Ahmed Aubrey trial, and the reactions from the news media struck me as, as curious to say the least. Um, the judges, juries are only good when they agree with what I want. I, I find it fascinating. But folks getting theirs, again, a jury case where three men in Georgia, I, I think it was Georgia, was it Georgia, the Aubrey case, that, that shot the young man, they found him guilty, going to put him, put him away for murder. Uh, there are folks, oh, let's go get him, let's go get him. And we can be that way in our lives. People want to mock our creator. Oh, let's go get him, let's go get him. God's going to take care of that. It is a righteous thing with God to recompense truth. It's not our place to go recompense tribulation. I don't use lamentations very often. Not a whole lot of occasions to go to lamentations, although one of the great songs that we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, comes from Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 55. Again, Jeremiah writes this, seeing the captivity of, of Israel, the captivity of Jerusalem, and he is just upset. He starts out in verse 1 of chapter 1. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? He is mourning. But he gets fired up in that passage of 55 through 64, and I won't read all of that. But Jeremiah, again, a man who's crying, a man who's sorrowful, verse 64, Render unto them recompense, O Lord, according to the works of their hands. He recognized it wasn't his place to go make, take revenge. Romans chapter 12, verse number 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For his written vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. The Lord will sort out all the details. I've said this multiple times. There's the situations um, in life that I shake my head at, sometimes from even from believers. Like, why would a believer do that? And the Lord will sort all that stuff out. We need to make sure we don't, we're don't. we not God's vengeance vehicle. We're, 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 the, we're the opportunity for reconciliation. I'm not saying we should just ignore sin. We should go help to reconcile when it comes to sin. We don't, we're not the executors of, of, reven of vengeance. Again, that's the creator's place. Next item. There's a coming rest, verse number 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And Revelation 19 is where I cite there the specific when Jesus comes back with his mighty angels. There's certainly a, a set of things right there, and we're going to talk about another set of actions that angels take. But Revelation 19 talks about a battle that's often called the Battle of Armageddon, that if you're a believer, you'll be part of the You'll be part of the, the riders is what we most believe. We're part of that army, verse number 14, that are following in white horses, clothed in white linen and fine linen, white and clean. And a judgment upon the earth that will take care of things. Rest is coming. But that coming rest, the reason Paul said that is because, hey, we're supposed to go do something. How many folks know, people, know a person, maybe it's, hopefully it's not you, that all they want to do is rest and relax and not do anything? I'd love to have that job. Is anybody willing to pay me to just relax and watch TV and do crossword puzzles all day? If you are, see me after church. I'd love to get that job. If you'd pay me just a mere $100,000 a year, and I will watch all your TV, do all your crossword puzzles, and I'll even pay my own taxes. You, if, just see me after church. 
And you, if you're online, I am, I'd like to say I'm kidding, but if you're willing to do that, let me know. <laughs> be, I think you'd be a complete fool to do that. But hey, um, strange things happen. Yeah, we as people are supposed to be doing something. There's not a place to rest when it comes to not doing something for the Creator. Again, you might say, I have physical limitations. I can't see. I can't do this. I, absolutely. I understand there's challenges. You don't want me playing the piano. I can play the, the first few notes from the theme of Dragnet. Never been an occasion I know of in church to do that. Boom, ba boom, 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 ba boom, boom, boom. I could do that. And if you know a song that has the theme of Dragnet, you've got to be old like me to know Dragnet, right, Jack Webb? This is the city, Los Angeles, California. You guys get me off track. I can play People Need the Lord for a little bit if you let give me hunt, hunt for a little bit. But you don't want me on the piano. It's like those nights when they do the pick a song, you know, the other night with Thanksgiving. Pick a song. My song would all sound the same. Bah, 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 bah. I mean, we're singing a cappella. Well, we all have something we go do. I don't know anybody that can't pray. Don't know anybody that can't make give a testimony, whether it's send a card, write a note, send a text, send an email, make a pie. There's all kinds of things we can do to be a blessing. It's not the time to rest. Now, time, now's the time to work while it is day. Next item. And I could camp there. The mighty angels of verse number 7, we'll go, we'll go back. I mentioned those in the past, in, in chapter 19, when Jesus is going to do some things. But the, the mighty angels, we get to see some of the things they do. Revelation, I, I've got Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, just as a, just, again, some, just some picked places. The four corners of earth, the angels holding the four winds that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now, I've been places where the wind wasn't blowing on the, on the land. Has anyone ever been to the ocean when the wind wasn't blowing? That would be weird. I've been, I've been to the Pacific Ocean. I've been to the Atlantic Ocean. I've been to the north part of the Atlantic. I've been to the Gulf of Mexico. I've been to all the different parts. There's always something going on there. These angels can control the wind. And boy, then it goes beyond that. These angels in chapter number 7 and chapter number 8, they do some just nasty stuff. The angels of chapter number 8. Well, one, one th throws out hail and fire mingled with blood, and a third part of the trees are burned up, and all the grass is burned up. In verse number 8 of chapter 8, Another angel sounds, and a mountain with fire sounds like a volcano, and third part of the sea becomes blood. Man, those, those angels do have some power. God's going to take care of, of judgment. Again, if, if you're being persecuted, if you're being you know, troubled for your faith, just keep keeping on. God is going to take care of that. Next item. And so there's two causes with consequence. Again, verse number 8 and verse number 9, challenging verses. That say in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are two causes for a real problem. And you might say, is it a work salvation? They didn't obey the gospel? Well, knowing God is important. John 17, 3, knowing God is what life eternal is all about. It's what Jesus said in John 17, great prayer of his in the garden, talking to his father. And this is life eternal. It's what he says, and this is life eternal that they might, not, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The purpose of eternal life is to do that. And so we ought to be cultivating that in this life. We ought to be spending time getting to know the Creator. And John 3, 36, God's a very binary God. God's not a gray area God. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So those two things of knowing God and obeying not the gospel is a failure to trust Christ as Savior, which enables us to have a relationship with the Creator. Again, I've got, does, does this particular, this is an iPhone, and I'm not here to promote Apple or it could be a Samsung or anything else if you're against Apple, I really don't care. But is this, does this particular device do me any good by itself? Some might say it doesn't do me any good even when it's connected. But right, this, this, this device does me no good if it has no ability to get to the Internet or get to the phone lines. How many folks have a phone at home that is, is of no value? It, for one, it's not plugged in, right, so it doesn't have any battery power. The same thing is true of our lives. Our lives are going to be ineffective until we are plugged into the Creator. And that plug into the Creator comes, as we mentioned earlier, from Romans chapter 10, through a relationship with Jesus Christ. You might say, why do you say that? Because that's foundational. Without that, the rest of it doesn't matter. So those two causes, a failure to know God and a failure to obey the gospel, leads to, next item, eternal consequences. Verse number 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. If there's any challenge I've heard to God, I've had people ask me that, why would a loving God send people to an eternal hell? Yeah, that's a good question. There's nothing positive about the, the place described as hell, which ultimately will turn it, will be dumped into the lake of fire, according to Revelation. 
And the description, Luke chapter 16, for those that say, well, well, hell's not a real place, people just disappear. Well, Jesus then made up a pretty weird story to just scare people. Is that what he did? Because in verse number 23 of Luke 16, And in hell he lift up his eyes, the rich man, being in torments and seeing Abraham afar off. And the description continues on, verse 25, He is now comforted, and thou art tormented. Verse number 28, the rich man in hell says, For I have five brethren that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Not a pleasant place. And why eternity? Why doesn't God just consume people? Because God created us as eternal beings. We are eternal. We are eternal souls that have to go somewhere. We have an eternal soul with an eternal spirit. The Bible says the spirit will go back to God. We have a body that's physical that will get an eternal body when we go to heaven. In, in hell, there will be no place for a body. It's an eternal soul that is, is tormented forever. And the sad part, from what I could tell the Scriptures, isn't the torment, it's but the fact God's not there. Because he mentions that right twice in there, the everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. The absence of the Creator. We are not where we're supposed to be. So hell's torment, again, awful place from description-wise. But the fact we have no access to the Creator, the access to that which gives us purpose, that's what you, He who gives us life is horrible. Again, I'm not here to say folks ought to get saved to avoid hell, though that is certainly a reason to not go there. But we get a relationship with our Creator that allows us again to do that which we were created for, not just for today, but forever. We get to forever be that which we were created for. How many of y'all would like to have a phone? Would you, how many folks have ever had just one cell phone and it worked forever? Anybody ever had one cell phone? How about one car? How would you like to have just one car that worked for the rest of your life? Or a refrigerator or a washer dryer? We had a chance to be created with a singular purpose that God's made us for, or multiple purposes God's made us for, and to do that forever with our Creator. What a thought. Next item. The beauty of that is not just a thought, it's a reality. And the glory and honor that goes to Him, the purpose of our creation. Verse number 10, when He shall come, become to glorified in all His saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony in you is believed in that day. What, what does it mean to glorify God? It, it's really to give Him praise and honor for, for that, which, that which happens. Again, it's, after some sporting events, I've seen some athletes get made fun of for, for praising God for something that happened on a sporting event. Jesus said it in, in John chapter 8, after being accused of having a devil, he said, I have not a devil, but I honor my Father, and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. And Revelation chapter 19, again, is, is praise to the, to the coming king that is coming to, to give victory. The verse says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. We should be doing this today. Our lives should give honor and praise, should redound, should reflect, should honor the Creator. You know, as a, as a Christian, if, if we live our lives in a godly fashion and take all the credit, shame on us. Again, we should live, we should give, we should live praiseworthy lives, but make sure that that reflects back to the Creator. Again, it's, it, to me, the sun, moon, and the sun, moon, and the earth are the right example. The moon, how many folks saw full moon? Was a couple weeks ago, was it last week? They had the big lunar eclipse, and the, the moon was real bright in the sky. Well, why is the moon bright? Did they, like, have the candles on? The moon is bright because of the sun. The moon has no light of its own. It's only supposed to reflect the sun. And again, I do find it fascinating. When, when you see no moon in the sky, what's the problem? The earth is between the sun and the moon. And so when the earth gets in the way in our lives, we will not reflect the Creator. Why to be the same way? I believe God uses the examples of that which we see around us as examples. That the only light comes from the sun. The only light comes from Him. And we need to get the stuff of life out of the way to reflect the Creator. We ought to honor Him. And it ought, it ought to be both in word and in deed. We ought to give praise to the Creator. Next item. I think I'll take us to the next page. And so the prayer at the end of the, of the chapter, verse 11 and 12, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness. Paul wasn't asking him to get to suffer, but he said he wants you to be worthy. We want you to be honorable. And the, good, and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, wants, Paul was looking for him. Hey, be consistent when it comes to, when it comes to prayer, this, this prayer time. And so it, the, the word always is the focus of that being consistent. That pray always, verse 6, Ephesians 6, 18 makes the same kind of statement. Praying always for, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Philippians 1, 4. I thank my God upon all every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making a request with joy. We ought to be, that's not saying we ought to be 24 hours a day, nothing but praying. But there ought to be a place in our lives we say, I've quit talking to God. 
We ought to be constantly going to God for help, going to God with praise, going to God with thanks, going to God with adoration, but going to God with needs, just as Paul was doing with these folks. He's praying for, for their nature or for their sake. Next aisle. And to be counted worthy. Again, that word doesn't get used a whole lot in the Scripture, and that is a humbling statement. Do you ever think about your life? Are you worthy of the Creator? And you might say, man, I know me. I'm, I, I do things I ought not do. Yet yeah, we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, saints of God. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, so far I through transgressions from us. This life of being worthy kind of ties that concept of blamelessness. Hey, are we doing what God would have us to do? Acts chapter 5, verse 41. Acts chapter 5, a situation where Ananias and Sapphira lie and have the terrible you know, situation with their lives. And then Peter who's called in because he keeps preaching Jesus. He gets thrown in jail, but he still keeps preaching Jesus. He got out of jail, still preaching Jesus. And they brought him back in and said, hey, you need to stop. And he said, hey, we're not going to go stop. And so after they had agreed, they called the apostles, verse number 40 of chapter 5, and beaten them. They commanded them, don't talk about Jesus. And they, they don't listen to him. Beaten for the cause of Christ. Beaten solely because they're preachers. And verse 41 says, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. I don't know about you. I've never been beaten for the cause of Christ, but I'm not sure I'd get real excited. You know, it's easy to say that. But we have the situation today, right? From my knowledge, this, the 17 missionaries in Haiti that were kidnapped asked for a million-dollar ransom. I, I, does anybody know the result of them? As far as I know, they're still under, under evil men's control. Yeah, I've not, I've not seen anything other than when they got kidnapped, and again, they were demanding a million dollars per person. Oh, did they? Okay. Okay, so 15 people then still, which is, wow, why? Because they're standing for, and I don't even know what their background is. I don't know if they, if they preach like us, teach like us, but apparently kidnapped for the cause of Christ. Whew. We just need to live a life that, God, that would please God and trust Him for the rest of that. Next item. And the calling, verse number 11 that talks about that. I'm sorry, verse, I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 11, worthy of this calling. And I've mentioned this already. I'd, I'd love to hammer this point. We, we have a purpose. We are called not just to salvation. We're called to serve. We are called to fulfill a set of works. Um, I'll, I'll read just one of those verses, Philippians 3.14, that says, here's what the real calling for you and I is. Paul says that I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We have a noble purpose for which we are created. We get a chance to serve the king of the universe, the creator of all things, to be part of his plan to make a difference. And I liken it to, to, to sports analogies. Some, some people are quarterbacks that get the, pray, the, the critical positions of column plays. Some people are wide receivers that are making big plays. Some people are running backs. And some people are the third string tight end to get that one two-point conversion that won the game for you. You know what? There, there's people I've talked to that have trusted Christ as Savior that aren't going to be known for anything. But when they stand before God, they're going to be glad about that. Again, I remember in college, my freshman year, talking to somebody about Christ. Didn't see him again until my senior year in college when a guy was, one of my buddies was getting baptized in a church, and this same person that I'd seen years ago was being baptized. Hey, let's, let's go fulfill what God created us for. Let's go do something for him, that which we're created for. Next item. You might say, you keep saying that we're created for something. Yeah, I get excited. God made me for a reason to go do something for him. And this fulfillment that we're supposed to fulfill is the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. You know, the good pleasure of his goodness almost sounds egotistical. We're just here for his pleasure. But the Bible does say that. We're here for his pleasure. But we get a lot of benefit because we get to do his work with power. We get to again, be part of what he's doing, whether it's singing the song that's a blessing to somebody's heart, whether it's praying the prayer, whether it's the food boxes we're going to give out, whether it's operating. If you're wrapping presents at the Christmas store for some kid and that kid takes his presents home to mom and dad and mom and dad come to church here and they trust Christ as Savior, you know what? You're putting a little bit of scotch tape on a Saturday afternoon when you could be doing other things. Is part of what God wants you to do to reach people for Christ. It's exciting. God can use scotch tape. Yeah, he uses, uses greeting card. He uses all kinds of things to fulfill his good pleasure and his work of faith with power. Next item. And we are here to glorify the Savior, glorify Christ. Lots of verses. I love 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? What? No, you not. No, you not. Hey, we're the temple of God. We're here to glorify him. Life's not about us, it's about him. Next item. 
And he will up it. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's okay. Who will glorify us? That's uh, what an amazing statement. He says that the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him. We're going to be glorified in him? Romans chapter 8 talks about that, the verse that most folks like, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them or are called according to his purpose. I think Pastor preached this a couple weeks ago, maybe. That especially gets to verse number 30 that talks about, that makes the statement that whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. I'm sorry, verse 30, it says, more whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. We will be glorified. Man, why? Because we're redeemed. Next item. And then the last one, everything that happens by grace. If you and I get to a place we think it's all about us, we can, I mean, when I get up here and tea, I just, I just put the slides together, just let her done. Somebody come up and sing, just, just sing the song. Go, Brother Ray, go play the piano. Blah, 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 just get her done. It's all by the grace of God we get to do these things. Galatians 2.20, we used to have that on the, on the back wall on a verse. I'm crucified with Christ, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That by the grace of God, we are able to serve him. Verse 21 I don't have that one memorized. I've got to go look at it. Oh, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. We're enabled to serve him. And with that, some things to think about out of a lesson. We're going to build that to the last page. Does what I do and say glorify him? A again, I, I get particular on... I, the reason I put the stuff up there on the screen is because I believe I'm supposed to, to be a blessing, to try to be a help. I would feel like I am dishonoring my creator. But you might say, is there a Bible verse I used to put stuff on the screen? It's on the screen back there too, right? No. That's what I believe I'm supposed to do to try to be a help. Let her be. There's sometimes my attitude needs help. I do not get excited about people that mock the creator. And there are people doing all kinds of reasons for gender reasons and sexuality reasons and just per principles. We are made fun of. We are the anti-vaxxers. We're the haters. We're the, we're the folks that drink the Kool-Aid. We, we hate the Muslims and we hate this and we hate that. And I wish people would just speak truth. I, I read Time Magazine, and it, it, again, if all I knew about Christianity was Time Magazine, I'd go sign up for another religion. I need to be prayerful. You know, I need to pray for Rachel Maddow to trust Christ. I need to pray for people who are liberal to go trust Christ. I need to pray for people. Because, hey, somebody prayed for me when I didn't know anything about Christianity. And let her see. You know, we can talk about what God created us for. What am I doing today that God called me to go do? It's easy for me. I know I'm supposed to go teach class. It's easy to do that for, the, for that last 45 minutes. What am I supposed to do in church? Is there something I'm supposed to pray with? Is I'm supposed to pray for? Is there money I'm supposed to go give? Am I supposed to be a help? Am I supposed to be, again, some of you all are nursery workers. I see who's supposed to be the pianist. I see who's supposed to be the sound. But what's you and I's purpose just sit in the pews? Who are we supposed to be a blessing to? Is there someone we should go talk to? We ought to be asking God, God, show me what I'm supposed to be doing. And then when he shows you, let's just go do it. Again, I don't know about you. You might tell, I get jazzed up. God created me for a purpose, and he allows me to do it in the greatest country on the face of the planet with outstanding people who are a blessing in so many ways. What an exciting God we get to serve. Let's make a difference in a world that needs the Savior. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we love you. We need you. We thank you uh, for the opportunity. Just as the Thessalonica church nearly 2,000 years ago was there to, to fulfill that which you created them for, we are here today, uh, Lord, on this final Sunday November, as fall turns into winter. Uh, Lord, help us to be folks that proclaim the Savior, uh, that are a blessing, whether it's uh, on a float in a parade, uh, whether it's here at church, whether it's with our children or grandchildren, with our neighbors. Uh, Lord, help us to be light and salt. We pray again, if there's one that needs the Savior, that today be the day of salvation. Uh, Lord, for believers, help us uh, to be obedient to you, to, to get rid of the garbage that would get in the way uh, of us fulfilling that which you created us for, and Lord, to pursue with diligence that which you crave for, realizing by grace, uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, through the truth of your word, you enable us to do amazing things that will make a difference forever. Lord, bless the service to follow. Help us to honor you, we pray in Christ's name.